Hello and welcome. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are around the world. It's a pleasure to welcome you back here at the Light 'em Up Lounge with two special guests, uh, the Beard Brothers, joining us live from the factory over in Honduras, uh, live from Dan Lee. What a pleasure, Sebastian de Copé, Brian Motola. It's fabulous to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time, joining us here today at the lounge live from the factory this is very special and i'm super looking forward to hearing uh, some some amazing stories from you hopefully getting a little bit of a tour and maybe some sneak uh, views behind the scenes behind the curtains of cavalier genève cigars um so without further ado gentlemen welcome to the light em up lounge the, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us thank you for having yeah thank you we're yeah, we're like bearded brothers and bold brothers, but also sharing just my screen. So I hope it's going to work <laughs> out. <laughs> but, um, we've had we've had the beauty, you know, beauty of uh, of, of, of being here is that Wi-Fi and the electricity in general is the most unstable thing ever. So, <laughs> so if it ever happens, we'll just reach join out of phone. Uh, we'll figure it out. But I hope everything goes well. And thank you for having us. Well, we can hear you for now, which is already a good start. And I think we'll, we'll figure out the rest as we go. Now, Sebastian, we had you on the show um, months ago, um, I, I guess well over a year ago. I, I can't believe it's, uh, it's, it's more than two years that we're doing Light em Up and uh, what a journey it has been, but what a journey it has been for you. And uh, Cavalier Cigars is just going from strength to strength your vision turned into a wonderful boutique operation, a super successful business and, and brand. And now with, with, with Brian on your side, things have gotten to, to a new level and to, to new speed, I would say. Um, give us a little bit of a rundown of um, how you experienced those last couple of months and, and the last few years and that, that very organic evolution of, of Cavalier. Where do you feel you're now along your journey with the brand? Uh, well, thank you and congratulations on the plus year. I'm just surprised. Last time we were together here was definitely over a year ago. Um, as we all know, it's just every every time everything goes a little quicker and faster. And and I'm very happy. To, uh, I'm very happy to catch up again with you guys and, and with you. Um, real pleasure. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. You know, uh, we are obviously a stronger brand on the market. You know, one of these uh, babies around. Put it that way. <laughs> Um, and yeah, Brian joined us. That's been that's been uh, absolutely fantastic for us. It's it's been something that we really you know we really did feel more than that. You know, we really uh, took much more than just a position with us. But I'm sure he'll be able to talk a little bit about it <laughs> after. But yes, we started you know a couple of years ago. Now it's been probably around seven years. I, I, I lose count of like the start you know, with uh, with third party back great people. And great, great people help us. But uh, about a year and a half, year and a half ago now, we got to the point where we think that it was continuing on that path and actually make a difference and really, and really um, bring that whole thing to life. Uh, it was probably a good idea. To back right now. So we did, uh, we did open last January. So it's yeah, about a year and four months, I think, something like this. Um, and from there, uh, everything very drastically, very fast. We actually outgrew that space here in about a year. So actually, that was here for do what we do a lot of stuff. And the thing we're trying to figure out is how to expand um, several other operations, uh, factories, and so to be able to grow because this 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 space is actually full. So we went from zero pairs to twenty one pairs. So that's three pairs on our hundred market. Sebastian, your, your audio is cutting off every now and then. Um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it's the Wi-Fi or maybe the microphone, but um, maybe you can just double check. Um, 
I, I hope that uh, all our other viewers can hear you properly. Um, That's better. Yeah, it, it sounds better and, and, and I hope that the Wi-Fi stays stable and that we can properly hear you. Um, in the meantime, let me just tell everybody, if, if, if you guys have questions um, for, for Brian and for Sebastian, um, if you're watching on Facebook, then please put your comments, your questions underneath the live stream. I'll forward all of them to our fabulous guests. And if you're here at the lounge with us via Zoom, then please make yourselves heard so we can bring all your questions in. Um, um, Brian, sorry. maybe... To check if it's any better now. Yeah, that sounds much better. But um, I, I think also your connection looks better. So um, okay. we should be good to go. Um, yeah, it, it, incredible, Sebastian. I mean, you, you, you pretty much uh, just opened that new factory. You already outgrew that space. Like, how, for, for all the people to, to truly just understand, how difficult is it to, to take that bold step and, and change from just the brand owner, quote unquote, to operating your own factory, trying to, to go fully vertically integrated. And it, it just changes the whole dynamic of the game and, and gives you a totally different bandwidth in terms of quality control. But it also puts a lot of stress and, and burden on your shoulder just by the amount of people that you have employed. And tell us about that. I think that's a, that's a pretty right way to say it. Um, it's actually very difficult. You know, I always said I would never have a factory. Um, I always said I would never have a factory because there are people that know how to do it really well. And um, you can have as many factories as you want. If you don't grow the tobacco you need, uh, it's going to be a difficult step, right? So you definitely, you know, we had to make sure that the right people were there for us and would back us up with raw materials and stuff like this, because, you know, you, you take the biggest responsibility when you do this is you need to find the right people that can run it with you, that have the understanding, the knowledge, and you need um, the people that, you know, you take the responsibility for all those people you employ, right? It's, it's, um, it's not only them, it's their families. If it's 100 people, you can easily make it time four, time five, right? Between the children, the, the spouse, whatever it is. Um, so you actually take the responsibility of saying, I need to pay these people every week, right? You can't just say, oh, we'll see what happens. So I think the, the, the burden, the pressure is, is there, but it's also the beauty of it because that's, that's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's the most rewarding part of it, you know, when that works out and you can actually provide directly for these people, you feel so much more in line with why we're doing it. And, 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 you know, it gives you a real reason to do it. It's, it's not just a brand anymore. It becomes a real family. We went from a team that was without counting, you know, we have independent sales and stuff without counting that part and the partners across the world. We were five, <laughs> four, <was> two, <laughs> yeah, well, two, three, well, now two here, but one, two, three, four, five, we were five. And you go from five to nearly a hundred, right? In a, in a, in a heartbeat, in a, in a couple of months. So it's, it, it is, it is really, it, it, it is amazing but it, it definitely is a little bit stressful. Yeah. I think it's, I think everything is, is these partnership raw materials are absolutely key because that's, that's the heart, you know, you have all the people, but to make that happen and to keep these people busy and, and, you know, hold on your side of the, the, the agreement, you, you actually need those raw materials. So it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult step. Um, but it's also, I think, key we would never never have changed the face of the brand that fast uh without that step yeah well what what, what made you change your mind ultimately i mean when you said you, you're never gonna own uh, own a factory and, and you're never gonna take on that burden what was it that ultimately convinced you of he called me and said let's i'm thinking about opening a factory i said okay i'm in <laughs> That was about it. <laughs> no, um, you know, there was there was that. There was that definitely because Brian, way before he actually worked with us, um, had a lot of, I, I, I was very regularly um, asking him for his advices and his, you know, his, his vision of things because he's always been a very good advice way before we worked together and very good friend. And, um, but uh, so there, there was that phone call and I also had a, a we, we were getting into one problematic, which 
for you guys that know our brand, it's a very, very, very labor intensive, very delicate, very difficult packaging. Not only the production, you know, the production is is something everybody handles because you know, you know, you can go from low end to very high end cigars. Everybody can kind of any fact nearly any factories have the ability to adapt their production to your demand approximately, right? But packaging, that was something that nobody else has do the way we do. So um, to give you just a little idea, the, the size of our packaging right now um, uh, department is the size of a factory that would do about two to two and a half times our production. That's how labor intensive our packaging is. So our factory is at 1.5 million cigars a year and made and we have a packaging for a factor the size of the factory that should be doing three to four million cigars a year. That's how much we were asking third party factories to do. And obviously you never, you know, when, when we started growing or growing at first, when it's small volumes, it works. But when it started becoming bigger volumes, it was starting to put a really big burden on the third party. Um, and we would not, you know, we were slowly not getting what we were asking for in terms of visual and, and and that could not continue so we had to take the decision and and the conversation was made with people from the third party and uh people like the the, the placentia family that that um made me made me take that that phone and call brian and say hey we have the green light on that side what do you think right what should we do so brian what was it that ultimately convinced you this is something I want to get involved with? This is a journey that I want to be a part of. This is not just, you know, it's it's not like any other boutique brand on the market. Why Cavalier? So that, that's a great question. Um, and it was really easy. It's the guy sitting next to me, right? Um you know, the one thing I always do is look forward, right? I'm always forward looking. Uh, I wish I could live in the here and now, but I'm always looking ahead of what's, a, what's in front of what's in front of. And I see Sebastian as the next generation of uh, cigar blenders, right? So he's going to be making, you know, I mean, he's, he's young enough to be my kid. <laughs> yeah, by the way, he's not my father, right? He might look like <laughs> but you know, I mean, that's what the decision made it real easy for me is uh, the investment is in the future of the industry, right? More than, um, yeah, obviously it's. It, I watched Cavalier, I watched it evolve, um, you know, and I, I, I knew that at some point in time there was going to be a time to join. It just had to be right. Um, but the factory came first for me. And when he called me, it literally, I was driving down the road and he's like, yeah, I'm thinking about opening a factory. And I'm like, okay, I'm in, let's go. And um, that's because I see the future and, and what I know he doesn't like when people talk about him. He's a very humble man, but he does represent the future of cigar manufacturers and, and blenders. And that's what we need as an industry, right? We need, we need these guys that are going to carry us for the next 25, 30 years or longer. Yeah, probably not so longer. But... <laughs> so it was a really easy decision. That's great to hear. And I, I very much appreciate the, um, what you said about Sebastian. I mean, we experienced that from, from the first second that, that, that we had the pleasure to to engage and, and and have those conversations on the first show, and I think that's what um, what everybody's perception is of, of of Cavalier and Sebastian. It's that very down to earth, very authentic and and humble approach and and, and character of, of you as a person, but also the brand in general. And I I fondly remember when when we had our first show when you said that. It, it truly is a family operation and now you, you you just sort of extended the family and and made it substantially bigger now what what i'm curious about is um 
having the guts and the bold idea of opening a factory is one thing. Getting it all done is is a whole new animal. Um, what does that process look like? If somebody who's watching us right now probably has the same crazy idea, well, I'm going to open my cigar factory. That's all nice and fluffy and, and, and sounds rather, rather funny, right? How do you make it work? Where do you, where do you find one? Where do you start? Like, That's a great question. <laughs> and and, and, and it, 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 there's a real simple formula for us because we were on uh, uh, a live last week and somebody said, you guys just spent the last 45 minutes talking about the people that work with you rather than talking about yourselves. So I think that's where it really starts is to surround yourself with the right people. And, and if you don't have that, you know, buy a Corvette, drive cross country, whatever country you live in and call it a midlife crisis and don't open a factory because at the end of the day, It's not about the building. It's about the people that work in the building. So you have to really surround yourself with great people. Yeah. Brian always says something. He always says, you know, um, that we, we sometimes we share some time, you know, talking with people just after the regular business hours of the factory and, and people like, can you show around? And um, it's a little bit what Brian said earlier with midday. Most of them are eating right now and it's just an empty shell, right? Um, the difficulty, I think, what, what really is key is the knowledge. The difficulty with a factory or, 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 you know, a brand is something that you can, let's talk by experience, that you can kind of wing for a certain amount of time until you find some more people to help you go further, right? A factory, you cannot wing. You can't wing this. This is suicide. Um, you really, really, really need to... If I, if I looked at it right now and if I was alone or just with Brian and had no support of people that knew and had already done it, I would never have done it. We would never have done it. Just because as much as we love tobacco and, and we learn every day about it and, you know, we grow in it, there is essential, essential parts of the operation that we had no idea of and that still we rely on the people that are part of the team to make happen, you know? You, you turn around to Raul, which is right now dropping a customer of the factory to the airport. So he's not with us today. Um, he's our general manager here, the, the, the head of the entire operation. The one that we blindly trust when we're not here and even when we're here, you need someone like him where we turn to him and say, hey, we need to increase that production to that much. How much is it? Is, is it filler tobacco? He goes on his calculator and hey, that's, that's the number. So, you know, um, and, and, and those kind of things, you know, you, you need to, there's, a, there's things that you can grasp and understand, but making it a daily routine is different. You know, it's, it's easy to understand that a tobacco like uh, San Andres or a tobacco like Paraguay or a tobacco like Broadleaf has a bigger central vein and a, and a bigger uh, vein structure and so weighs more. And so when you take that off, you're also going to take away a bigger chunk of the actual weight of what you bought than if you do it with Habano. That's, that's something that's easy to understand. But how do you calculate those kind of things? How do you make sure you buy enough in advance to cover your production? You know, all those kind of things that, that are detail after detail after detail, you need to rely on, on departments and head of departments and put those people in because they know what they're doing, packaging. It's as simple as that, you know, um, who do you buy from? What do you buy? What is the price? Why? How much? How many times? How long does it come to come in? How do you run your licensing? You know, the licenses and everything. So a lot of, of stuff like this that that might sound simple in theory, but that in practice, like any other business, is actually complicated. So find the right people and get the backup from the right people. And, oh, Vlad is here. Ooh. Yeah, I know he He was texting me. Oh, he I, was texting I told him we were what we were doing. <laughs> that that was here and visited us and left uh, yesterday, right? And then Jeremy left. And Jeremy uh, left this, today this yeah. morning. Jeremy, because there you saw. What a pleasure to see Vlad here again. I smell trouble. Vlad, welcome, welcome back. It's been a while. We... <laughs> <laughs> Just ask. Sebastian. Speaking of the right people, um. 
how did you ultimately decide on um, where to put your chips on the table? Um, how did you ultimately decide these are the people that I want to have run the operation, the guys in charge? Um, be because that's a that's one hell of a task, right? To to get the commitment from those people to to really also in, invest their time and energy into into this project to get it with you. Yeah, it's a question of finding people that have the same vision, that share share your vision, right? When you did something that comes not from me but from him, um, you need to find the people that don't work for you or but people that work with you, right? People that share that vision, share that mentality. And every company has a different vision. So it's it's really, it's a tough, it's a tough call. But let's be honest, um, we brought some people to the table and once again, um, other people did help us. You know, when you have uh, people from the Placencia family that say you should take that person to do that thing, then you listen and you do, right? Because you're talking about people that have the understanding and know who they're talking about. So once again, it's it's like the same thing that happened when I started. You know, I was lucky to have the advice of the right people, I think. Um, and and once again, in this case, a lot of people from the Placencia family helped us a lot because they pointed the fingers at some people. They pushed some people out of their operation to help us put ours together and replace them because they felt that it was a good opportunity for those people. They said, hey, they are going to offer you what we can't offer you right now. Go and take this position. And then they told us, hey, this person is able to take that responsibility on. And not only that, that person understands what she's doing, what he's doing. And that person is also well respected amongst people that they're going to supervise in their own departments, for example. You know, yeah. you need a, a simple thing, for example, it, when, you know, when you, you start a new factory that has no reputation locally, and that's something to, to see. It was a brand new company here. So nobody knew about FCT, right? No rollers, no pairs, no, no nothing. So when you look at production, for example, you need to figure out someone that was already uh, managing production, uh, Jefe Producción, and that has a phone, num a phone with a, you know, a, good, a good list of, of pairs in there and call them and say, hey, I took that position there. If, you know, we might we always enjoy working with you. Why don't you come and check us out, you know, and try to bring people here ultimately until you get to the point where those people work with you and, and understand why they work with you. But, but myself or Brian, how the hell do we get Paris in? Yeah. We walk around in Nanli and ask people if they're rollers. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, you know, and then, I mean, on, on top of that, um, just to uh, everybody keep in mind that, the industry is under a lot of stress currently with shortages, not only in terms of raw material, but especially in terms of labor and, and, and people who who can work the Galera floor. Um, I mean, there, there's been quite a bit of brain drain from the manufacturing countries, uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, I believe even the Dominican Republic. And, and factories are having a hard time to, to keep up with the demand and the production volumes. Um, because of the tobacco but but again as i said also because of the people yeah it's it's been very we talk uh, it's very interesting because usually i know we talk about you know oh tobacco shortage container prices which is all a fact right i can tell you that across the board the raw material cost went approximately up around a 25 percent range that's just the raw material cost be between last year and this year so so covid year to covid year so that's how bad this is. But but that's what we talk about. People don't don't really sometimes. I mean, we should probably talk more about this, where um, the resources, the people finding finding your pairs that are or your packaging team or, you know, enough people that have the skills and are dedicated and are going to stay with you. Um, is a challenge. And this has been a big, big, big challenge when we first opened for a couple of months. We, we needed more and we needed more production, but we did not find the people to work with. Um, and uh, it, it changed. Uh, I think it helped. It does help the fact that we don't need 100 pairs, right? Let's put it that way. If we needed 100, bear, uh, 100 pairs, we'd probably be in pretty big trouble. 
Um, but the fact that we are at 21, you know, and that we basically filled up the space with this, we actually had a space, the, the, the original calculation was about 16 to 18 pairs maximum with the space we had. We arranged a little bit and we pushed it to 21, but we're really, you know, that's, that became manageable, manageable because it's a, it's a, it's a human sized operation. Let's put it that way. It's still, it's funny, it's still 80 ish people, but it's, it's, it's still a baby factory, right? We're really talking baby factory. Oh yeah. Um, because we briefly mentioned the, the tobacco shortages, um, A, can you tell us a little bit about the, the materials that you're working with and, and, and where do you currently source them from? And B, we had a question over on Facebook coming from Brian Lewis. Um, he heard that um, Cavalier doesn't use uh, Ligero in the blends, and he was wondering if that's actually the case and if you would uh, continue that way. So first part of my question is you actually want me to give you all my little secrets. <laughs> you guys want to share as many as you want to share with us. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Um, it just, it's just funny because it's, you know, we're in an industry where we don't care sharing this information. When you think about it, you switch to any other industry and people would probably literally just leave the live and say not happening. Right. But it's, it's, that's the beauty of the industry. Nobody cares. I appreciate um, you staying on, Sebastian. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm more than joking, but yeah. Um, so uh, of course, uh, that's not to mention. Just uh, one to start with. Obviously, a big chunk of what made that possible for us is uh, our partnership with the Placencia Group. Right. Uh, the same. I think it 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 happened uh, once again, and the, the partially. Uh, because of the years that we've known each other and the years that that it, just because the one family once again that that took the time and allowed me to learn when I came here and I think that really allowed that ne that next step to come together so they've been immediately on board with us and immediately supported and I've, I mean I have no words to say how much they made things possible in these hard times. Um, there are other people like Oscar uh, Valladares from Leaf, right? He's been someone that uh, we've known for several years. That's, um, we always had a very good relationship. And uh, he also immediately, you know, opened um, his doors for, our, <clears throat> for us and said that, you know, he would help and he never failed on that. He always did help. So, and, and then there are other providers, of course, but smaller or, or providers from other countries, but locally, I would say those are the two big ones that are easy to mention because they will really also speak to a brand level to people. Uh, and not only, um, because there is a lot of providers that are exclusively uh, in raw materials and that obviously in the market doesn't, I mean, most people wouldn't, wouldn't be able to link that to to uh to someone or a face or something like this so those two are very easy and they have been probably uh two of the biggest keys of making that possible um so those those are, are part of it then uh on the, the tobacco side uh yes it is nearly 100 percent true uh meaning there is only one blend in which we use the hair all the rest is nearly exclusively viso, which for those who would not be familiar with it, the easiest way to cut the, the plant in piece, I mean, in, in, in chunks to, to make it visually understandable um, without talking cuts and everything. And then you'll have um, a first segment, which is the bottom of the plant, which is gonna be called seco. The second, which is in the middle of the plant that is gonna be called viso and the top of the plant, which is basically going to be called ligero. Uh, higher you go on the plant, the higher the priming, the higher the, the cut, uh, the thicker and uh, heavier or even stronger the leaf is going gonna, is gonna to taste and become, right? The structure is going to be thicker, uh, every, the vein, everything, everything is visually, uh, you can touch it, you really feel the difference of grain to the leaf and, and thickness but also in flavor, it's going to have a huge impact and the combustion too. Um, in my case, uh, and in just in, our, in general, in our case, but what I've been taught is working mainly with visos. 
And um, that's what we do. And, and the, the only blend that actually uses Ligero is the USA exclusive, which is an exclusive for the US market. All the rest is or exclusively Viso, including binder and, and wrapper, which is pretty uh, unique. Um, or the white, white label, white series, which in that case we use Seco and Viso. Uh, and in that case, a wrapper is a Seco. But typically, if you want an example, you can take the, the Black 2, which is the, the San Andres softbox press line. Um, the 100% of the, the, that cigar is actually Viso from different primings. So you get different thickness and different kind of intensities in there. Uh, and obviously different areas uh, where the tobaccos have been grown and different processes to that tobacco, meaning different uh, fermentation processes. Some we partially do here and some others are 100% managed by other people. Um, and the Viso Jalapa is in the same range. So yes, we use, I use mainly Visos when I work with tobacco. We produce with mainly Visos uh, very, very, very rarely. Uh, this is that one exception that uses Ligero for us, yeah. Now, since you already mentioned a few of the different lines within the brand and, 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 and different projects that you've been working on, how has owning and operating your own factory changed the way that you tackle new releases, coming out with, with new lines, or even just um, continuing what you already had on the market in terms of the consistency, um, not only performance wise and, and technically, but also just in when it comes to the sheer aroma and flavor, making sure that, that you have that continuation throughout your existing brands. So it's, it's, that's one of the hard tasks, right? Um, I think we've, we've very, the fir my first, thought I have on this and it is always the same uh, when we come to that subject is I think we as an industry very poorly educated the consumer of this industry. Think about the wine, uh, wine industry. Do you expect to have the 2018 and the 2002 to taste the same? You don't. You, take, you expect a certain range you expect certain profiles based on the, the growing areas and everything and based on the chateau or the domain or, or the house you're buying that wine from. You do not expect to have the same wine. In the cigar industry, we have been, I think, let's put it seriously, we've been idiots and we said, hey, the cigars must every single time taste the same. It's a product from the earth and everything, but consistency is important, right? The first part of the consistency was to make sure that we, 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 we sourced our tobaccos the same way that um, uh, the past third party factory did. Luckily enough, we use the same sources. We, say, we use the same people um, and that allowed us for a consistency. Uh, one thing that, that is important for me is that we always, I was, we were actually smoking some whites yesterday, or we try some different balances. We try to rework it a little bit just to make sure that we always stay in the right range and also to make sure to understand the tobaccos we're using and what we have to do to provide that experience. But we always think about, hey, if we do this little change, is it going to improve that cigar? And if it does, does it stay in the right range and if it does do we want to implement that that um, little you know extra step or this, does it work as a cigar but is it too far from that range do we have to think about keeping it as a side blend for something else or do we just stay exactly where we're at so one thing to understand is let's say you buy Esteli you buy a steli from the same provider, always the same viso, everything the same, the same, the same cut. So you, you really stay in that uh, one way of sourcing. Um, that is the Lee, one might be from last year and the other one from this year. And the, 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 the third back out, the third bail might be from four years ago, five years ago, whatever, you know, just growing years out there. Um, even if it comes from the same field, the same provider, the same process and everything, the same cuts on the plants, the earth has not been the same. I mean, from one year to another, the earth is, 
the nutrients change. You've planted more there. It's been one more year, two more years, five more years. So the nutrients component is slightly different. The weather has been different. The process is, is a very natural process. One year because of your humidity in the year, because of how hot it is, or how cold it gets, or how dry or whatever it is, uh, or the people that work the tobacco for you. Um, one year it's going to you know, take a certain amount of time. The next year, the pilon is not going to do everything. You can't, it's not a machine, right? Your, your pilon, your process is not going to do the exact same peak and it's not going to have the exact same weight and the exact same leaf and everything. So you have to, to really grasp that this, the, the task of consistency is a very difficult one because it's a natural product. It always varies from one bale to another within the same bale it varies. The tobacco is slightly different. So it's, it's that, that process. How do we keep it? I think the keys to keep that consistency is keep the same providers, make sure that you know your process and how this process is made. Check every bale when you open it. Take the tobacco. If it's not tobacco for you, use it for something else. Use it, you know, find another use for that tobacco. Um, you know, get a production for someone else for short fit. And use that tobacco as a base in there, you know, as a, as a, um, you know, you can, we're saying it when you, when you roll, you can sometimes use nice filler leaves as, as bases. So you can actually create an additional structure out of the binder and, and, and wrapper so that the cigar actually holds better and stuff like this. Maybe use that tobacco for this, which is a lower end cigar, stuff like this. So it's, it's a difficult task, but it's actually very interesting. Because once again, I think our industry did a mistake and then quiet tell the right story to the consumer. And that is something that can only be blamed on us as professional, professionals in this industry, all of us. Well, I, I think there's some, certainly other industries out there as well that primarily play on the consistency game as opposed to to a more vintage uh, expression and, and and seeing the changes when I think of cognac or uh, a single malt, you know, apart from single cask additions, they also rather try to stay within a rather narrow house style and, 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 and consistency in terms of the delivery of their product. But um, I, I also fully agree, and, and Andre Diaz, our, our friend over on Facebook, commented that he, he, he sees it exactly like, like you, Sebastian, that we should uh, probably be more appreciative um, of the, the evolution and see the changes over time and how, how mother, mother nature and uh, you know, the weather of one particular year might change certain cigars. Do you think this is something where Cavalier could be more explorative and, and go go into a little more sort of bringing that vintage expression and, and allowing certain variation within your blends just to showcase well this is a natural product and 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 you just have to accept the sheer fact that every single year mother nature will give you different raw materials and here's the result i would propio, propio. i would um love to actually i really think it's an amazing um an amazing way that it could be conducted at least partially um the real question is how you know what what would be the process how would we do that but i think it's amazing if it's something that can be done uh and we figure out how it would be done properly because that's always a thing right you want to make sure that you're not just throwing something out there that doesn't make sense um, maybe by learning from other industries that did it differently, we could at least partially uh, try to do this. I really like the idea, Reinhardt. I really do. Yeah, I do. Too. I, I think you have to main, maintain the integrity, right? But yet accept that there is going to be variations because of, you know, the beauty of it, right? That's really the beauty of it is that we're taking a product that uh, Mother Nature's giving us. And, um, you know, you stay within the integrity. It's not like you wake up one morning and decide to put San Andreas on the White Series, right? Like, like, oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah, that, that, that'll be fine. You know, I mean, nice that, tobacco, that yeah. would be throwing everything out the door. But I think as long as you maintain the integrity and the depth of flavor and the layers of flavor that you look from or expect come to expect from a certain uh, line within a company. I, I think that's more than fair. I mean, I think it's actually 
really unique and exciting to see, hey, what is it evolving to? What's it going to be like? You know? Oh, to give you an example right here. So I was talking about a test that we ran that actually Raul, our general manager, ran yesterday. He was like, he gave me three cigars, put the numbers on. He said, just, just smoke and tell me. And I smoked the first one. I was like, hmm, interesting. It reminds me something that we work with but it's not exactly where we have to be. And then the second one barely smoked an inch, just dropped it in the ashtray. I said, that's really not something that I see. And then the third one I smoked, and I was like, this is really close to a white. This is really, really close. And he was like, yeah, I was just playing around to see what would make the most sense if I had to work with something else. And I was like, interesting. It's That was very, very, very much basically the same cigar but with a slight change and then so today yesterday night for today he they arranged this they made me this and say hey i wanted to try something else i got the cigar i'm really enjoying it but this is not at all in the range that it has to be mm -hmm. so i'm smoking it i'm actually thinking like hmm, we could use it. The, the change there was uh, a different wrapper from a slightly different part of the the the, the area where we we source the wrapper usually for the white and wanted the same seed and everything, just slightly further, uh, grown slightly further. And we're like, hey, let's try it. And it tastes completely different. I'm enjoying this, but this could never be, it's it's typically in this case, we went completely out of the range. So this is the kind of thing that you start thinking, you say, hey, if we ended up working with that tobacco, we could actually, where could we make that a fit, right? So you write that blend down, you put it in the computer and put it a name, put a name on it and then go back to it a little later, work with it. And then maybe something comes to mind. Maybe it fills a gap in the portfolio at some point, but for now it does not. It just is a very interesting cigar. I'm enjoying to smoke and that is not going to be in the market. That's the destiny of that particular cigar, right? In, in, in my humble opinion, um, where, where this sort of all culminates towards is the the storytelling element because ultimately the question is how do you communicate to the consumer that what you're presenting them with now is maybe a vintage expression of 2020 21 um, and it's slightly different from what you had the last time you went to the humidor and and, and bought the, the the very same cigar um and i We've seen different renditions of this on the on the market with um, the very successful Cosecha project that Claudio w was doing. Um, I know that um, with uh, with the Aviator series, um, you you see a lot of those uh, slight variations and changes um, because Darren is, is always playing with new stuff and, and he doesn't feel like crippled or he doesn't feel like it's a burden to always have to reach the same level of consistency and continuity in terms of aroma and flavor. And Brian, I would love to use that as, as a segment um, to, to some of um, of your obligations and the stuff that, that you're taking care of where the, the, the sales component of the storytelling is, is so critical. Um, how do you think it could be more effectively uh, communicated uh, to the consumer that um, this could be something interesting and the, the, the quintessential, you know, ultimate goal does not always have to be smoking the very same cigar year after year after year. Well, you know, we, we talk a lot, Sebastian and I, about, you know, what it is we do, right? And um, we share the same vision and the same opinion on this, is that we don't sell cigars. We sell experiences, right? And, um, you know, the, the, there's some challenges that exist out there because you have some people that say, you know, I only smoke this this size and in this price point, right? Like that's very close-minded in the experience that you're allowing yourself or the journey that you're taking uh, as a, uh, a cigar enthusiast, right? Not even as a cigar aficionado or whatever you wanna use the word, but as an enthusiast, somebody that, that enjoys a cigar. So I think, you know, the story, you know, 
being able to message anything is is key and it's critical, right? Um, and so I think, you know, the more we get to interact with um, people out there that enjoy a cigar, and I find myself telling people all the time, you know, I would prefer you smoke one really good cigar than five, you know, $3 bundle cigars, right? I mean, that's doing yourself a disservice, you know? I mean, now you're not going to light your, you know, up a, uh, um, a cigar that is meant to be enjoyed and go cut the grass with it. Yeah, there, there is their place for that quick smoke, you know, that that less expensive one. But when you're sitting down with your friends and you're going to enjoy and and enjoy the experience that we're providing, providing you know move around take a journey right all we ask as a manufacturer is that you come visit us every once in a while on your journey right that's that's really what's important to us so um i i agree we as an industry we need to do a better job of messaging this and um you know we'll do our best going forward to, to continue with our we sell experiences versus versus we sell cigars anybody can sell cigars we want to deliver an experience that you're going to remember and that you know there's nothing great i love when i see people post pictures of cigars but what i really enjoy is when the picture is of a group of people enjoying cigars because that's really the experience that we're, we're we're shooting for right it's about the people we smoke with and the conversations we have. I couldn't agree more. And the um, reason why I wanted to, to bring this up is um, you have been so successful throughout your career and been a voice for the industry and different brands. And uh, you did a tremendous job uh, with, with Illusioni. And so I'm, I'm curious to, to, to learn and understand and probably put on stage a little more of what it takes to be successful on the sales and and retail end because we we talk so much about the, the blending and, and and we spoke about the factory and everything that it takes on the brand level but we rarely talk about the efforts and the hard work it takes to successfully sell the brand and translate convey that message to the consumer uh, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, the so let's back up for a minute because the the most unsung hero in this industry are the people in the in the other room across from us uh, that work in in the factories. Those are the people that we want you to think about when you're smoking Cavalier, right? Uh, we don't want you to think about us. Sebastian, Brian, we want you to think about the people that are really behind producing that product day in and day out for you to enjoy. Um, that's really important to us, right? Um, so, you know, on the sales side of things, it's, it's about, like I said, if, if you think about yourself as selling cigars, you might as well just group yourself right in there with a car salesman or, you know, a, a vacuum cleaner salesman that used to go door to door. I'm a little bit older. I remember those days. <laughs> um, uh, but when you really embrace the fact that um, we're selling an experience and that as a member of an industry, we have to be guardians and stewards of this industry. And everybody on this call is part of this industry in one way or another, whether you're a consumer, whether you're, a, you know, have a, a podcast or a news information site, whether you're a blogger, whether you're a manufacturer, brand owner, store owner, work in a store, we're all part of this industry. So you, once you embrace the good of the industry as a whole and become a steward of the industry um, that you're part of. Because if you're not going to do it, like you can't expect my mom to support the cigar industry. She's just not going to, right? Um, you know, people that aren't part of this world, this community 
that we live in and we get to work in and we get to sit here and and, and share our, our little piece of heaven here with, um, we have to protect that aspect. We have to protect that industry. We have to be stewards and guardians of that industry. And if it means making an investment into uh, a younger generation cigar blender for to see the future move forward, that's what you do. Um, so the sales side of things is all about embracing the community that we create and the fact that we sell experiences rather than selling cigars because selling cigars is just a commodity function, right? Like, you know, I show up in a, in a shop and I get to say, how many boxes of white do you need? How many boxes of black? That's not doing anybody any kind of justice, right? It's taking that time, getting to know the individual who owns the shop, getting to know the people that visit the shop. You know, I mean, uh, I, make, I used to make the joke, uh, my kids calling me on the phone, sorry about that. Um, it's, you know, getting to know people uh, on a regular basis and interacting with as many people as possible, which, which is a huge commitment, right? I mean, I left my house, um, I don't even over know when, ago, yeah. over a month ago, and, and I'll be back in my house when we leave here on the 19th. I'll be there for three days, three and, then, days. and then, then, we go to New York. then we go to New York, and then we come back here. So, um, you know, to, to create that that real intimate experience requires you to make sacrifices. And if you're not willing to do that, then you do the whole industry as a whole of this service. Well, I think there's the family community part of it that really, that, that's, that's translated to this, right? It's not a product. And I'm, I'll be completely honest. I'm really happy to have him there because I'm the worst fucking salesman you'll ever see in your life. I can't sell water to someone that is thirsty that's how bad this is right i'm, I'm really bad at it let's be honest uh, but there is there is one thing is you know you get experiences someone that understands that and you get that commitment of sharing um sharing and taking time to share about stories i think that's been making a huge difference because then you create an emotional reaction to something you're not selling a product we're this industry is not made to be selling products. You can't, you can't, if you sell products, you'll sell once and it's going to die out. Um, and I think a big, and, and once again, I'm not on the sales side and I'm very bad at it, but I, I do think, <laughs> I do think that um, something that changed this industry a lot, um, there's been two big changes in my opinion. One, when uh, some brands started giving the example and went out, went out and visited and did events and showed their faces and shared their story and, and, and therefore got support and therefore got people emotionally attached to their brand and therefore are the most successful brands that you'll find on the market right now, 20 years later, 25 years later, 30 years later, because that's the range of the, the last change. Well, the, the change, the first big change in my opinion. And then the second big change is what happened now is what we're doing right now. People like you, Reinhardt, that actually put together, understood the value of community and put together um, uh, a new way to actually gather people around. And we're not talking, us talking about, you know, it can be really boring to just listen to us, but we're talking about all the people that you gather that are gonna watch your show because they want they, they feel part of what you created and they feel part of the industry. They become the voice of the industry. And I think that is the new big change because now not only you have the chance to be on the road and see people, but now we're sitting at the factory in Danali. We wish all of you were here with us, but you're not. But in a way, thanks to, to you know, uh, systems and, and, and um, uh, let's say press, I'll call it press, uh, online press, like, like you, um, I, I don't know what the best term for it is, uh, Reinhardt, um, and you'll probably help us fix that. Uh, but thanks to what you do, you know, things like Line em Up Lounge and, and, and a couple of other people, now it allows us to sit here and actually, as we'll do later, just walk around and show you the people. 
and this is, you know, this is something we would never have been able to do without taking people down here. We'd be like, hey, come this week, we have that open week, and then, you know, it's 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 pretty fantastic. And those are the two big things I think that change yeah. in this that change the face of this industry. So these these lives and and Zoom meetings and stuff like that allow allow you to spend a little bit more time and tell your story in a little bit more depth than you do at like a live event, right? But when you're at a live selling event, again, focused on the selling aspect of cigars, you don't get that intimate inter interaction. And, um, you know, like we can't wait to take you and show you around on the, on the, the floor because as I went back to where I started was the most unsung heroes in this, in this industry are the people in the factory and they, they really need to be in your thoughts the next time you light up a cigar um, because they're here day in and day out taking pride in what they produce and really um, keeping the industry rolling. Ah, see what I did one. there? Keeping the industry rolling and you know, without them, we don't have these great products to be able to share and the great experiences to be able to share. So should we take a little walk? Because I think they're around. Yeah. I think they're back Does that in. work for you right now? Does that work? Absolutely. Um, whilst whilst you're, you're traveling around, let's get Ian on the show who had a question for you. So maybe we can answer that on the fly whilst you're, whilst you're running around. Ian, over to you. Um. Thanks, Ron, and thanks, guys. And uh, having been to Esley, I'd endorse what you say about the uh, the people who work there because they do an amazing job. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is about the use of the uh, gold leaf on your yep. cigars. The only cigars I've had which have had it is the Royal Danish, and they sell for silly money. So yep. just we can't talk about that. And secondly, I'm, I'm in England, so I haven't had the chance to taste your cigars, but I was looking up uh, on Half Wheel and Charlie Monato was talking about your limited edition 2020. And um, it's a struck me the amazing uh, review he gave. He said it starts with nuts, earthiness, coffee bean, a bourbon hinted oak and some sweet, albeit not sugary flavors like ketchup. Then he goes on to say it's producing an umami reaction uh, and it gives it a meatiness that reminds him of bacon, though he says the cigar doesn't taste of bacon. He said, behind that is stone mustard, earthiness, black pepper. The finish has macadamia, nuts, peanuts, yellow mustard, and a bit of creaminess. Retrohaling produces sensations of buttered bread, earthiness, herbal flavors, and a touch of black tea. The retrohale is finished with raisins, dry bread, creaminess, and a touch of irritation, although not much in the way of pepper. Now, if that doesn't get your taste buds going, I don't know what will. So I'm really <laughs> excited to try that. Um, is that umami flavor something you've worked out, or is it just a happy accident that you've that you've got that, and that's what Charlie thinks of it? Um, it's a little bit of a mix of both. Uh, you know, um, I'm partisan of tobacco is tobacco, right? It tastes like tobacco, but at the same time. I think we all try to educate our palates as cigar smokers the same way we enjoy eating most of the time well and drinking something good. It's all part of the experience. So yes, tobacco is tobacco, but we always look at how it's going to be, what the final result is. And um, in general, I think that all comes from the, the, the big use of visos, right? Uh, more and more, I very early on, I started, um, I was taught to use visos over anything else. But more and more, my, my attention shifted a little bit. And um, I don't look at the fact that I need a 32-year-old visa right now. If it's two and a half years old and it's where it has to be, that's where I'm going to use it. And what I look into it, one thing that I learned from the, from honestly, from, from, the, from the, the Cuban market, what the Cuban cigars, one thing I learned from it is that this tobacco uh, that is grown in Cuba has some chewiness, some richness, some kind of oiliness to it without being strong. It's something that has that, that really that nearly that oil feeling to it, right? And so this is one thing that I've been starting to discover more and more in that visa range, especially with Criollo, with Habano seeds that are in the right range and with the right process. So I think that that umami place of it is really due to those use of visos that 
that gives you that richness and chewiness and oiliness uh, that gives you not the flavor, as Charlie said, not the bacon flavor, but gives you the bacon impression, you know, that, that there is always a big, there are two big, three big components, I think, when it comes down to tasting something. Obviously, the aroma, what you smell, the taste, the actual taste, what you're going to taste, what it's going to remind you of, or what it tastes like, and then the impression that is left on the palate. And I believe that this all comes, it's half an accident because it's a lucky accident because umami is something that who wouldn't look for umami in a blending session, right? Um, but you never, it's like looking for gold or you're a little bit like, like an alchemist with your team and you try to, to change, turn something into gold to stay on the right subject. And um, most of the time you don't hit it. Uh, and I think in this case, we were lucky to actually hit that goal that we were looking for. Uh, kind of knowing where we were looking at, but without having the guarantee that that would be the, the final result. Um, the gold itself, so you said, yeah, um, Royal Danish is, is, is a good example of, um, I think, you know, I stayed quite a, uh, there is a couple of brands that use gold and everything, and there's been people way before us. Uh, I just don't look at us being part of the gold crowd. Yes, we use the small gold single hashtag and everything because it's the symbol basically. But um, I, you know, the gold for us is just a means just because we use a lot of it on boxes and everything. And I guess I'm Swiss, so we probably <laughs> have some. Uh, there's something genetic uh, about genetics there. But um, I, I really think that we, we ended up using gold uh, mainly because it was a color that we used a lot. Um, on boxes and bands and everything and because we uh, we I look at it as a symbol the diamond shape that that that's um, that diamond shape is to me a band uh, and I that's how can I put this um, we don't put gold on a cigar to make it something fancy uh, we use the the diamond shape to make it recognizable and describable and it just became uh, a trademark and and and, and the, the the soul of the brand um but it could as well be chocolate if you want it i really don't care what we use to do it it's it's the symbol it stays true to the brand too right i mean there's gold in the streets in geneva so i mean you know you might as well uh stay true to the brand. but as far as an identifying factor it really helps cavalier in in that you know if you spend a lot of time in cigar lounges people will come in and the tobacconist will do a great job recommending a cigar. And then they'll come back in and they'll be like, hey, that cigar you recommended to me, I loved it. It had a red band on it, you know? And, and then the tobacco <laughs> is completely lost, right? As to like, well, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I have 500 I, with red bands. I have 500 with red bands. So. They're all good cigars, right? That's the thing nowadays. You go in the humidor. Yeah. I, I cha it's a challenging task to find a cigar that is not good. It is. They're all great cigars. So when a tobacconist does go out of the way to recommend Cavalier and then somebody returns, they say, hey, that cigar you recommended for me with the gold diamond on it, they automatically know there's no doubt in their mind what cigar. So we, we kind of it kind of serves two purposes. It stays true to the brand, um, but it also helps, um, you know, our, our, our local tobaccon, tobacconist uh for future uh recommendations you know and, and symbol. It's it symbol becomes a symbol and, and, and it's very easy to recognize and you don't have the language barrier anymore because you can describe a symbol in any language in this world or sign language whatever you want uh you will not be able to pronounce Geneva or Cavalier if you're in China right so you kind of have to figure out ways around it um let me just hand the phone to Brian I want to show you a little something most of the tobacco we have is so some of the tobacco we have is here, but then a good chunk of it is also in process somewhere else. So we have some here, Pinonas, that I want to show you because that's some very special stuff for me. I'm going to get uh, the light. Yeah. yeah. I'm start right here. So this was originally supposed to be our cigar lounge, by the way, at our factory, and it has now become something else. processing and Pilon storage. <laughs> so the first part I want to show you is for every pilon that is processed, there are sheets like this with the amount of pounds that we have, what it is, when it came in, and then a daily check of temperature plus to, to have, you know, uh, graphics. 
to know when it has to be rotated, if it needs more water, less water, if we need to cut the, the process because it's getting too hot. We want to keep it in certain ranges and let it work. And that's what I was saying. That's where you get actually every crop and every year and every loan that you have is a different animal. And that makes it every time a different tobacco. So right here we have Mexican tobacco. For example, or you can smell it. So, mm -hmm. well, it smells heavy. Oh, so. We haven't we haven't invented the technology yet where we can transmit the smell. Look at that. But scratch and sniff I mean, needs to meet Zoom. That's so that's rapper, right? Look at this color. Hmm. You can see how clean the leaf is, and so we process. And every time, every X amount of time, when we rotate, and we know we need more. Oh, we see that some is done or seems to be done with the process. We slowly, you know, turn this into out of the pinon kind of tobacco, uh, ready to be used or put in vodka. Um, but you can see. Yeah. Typically, you can see here that this tobacco is not ready yet. You don't have a uniformity in the color. You have a pretty nice color, but it's not ready. You can see here in the middle of close to the central vein, which is the last spot that is gonna get, you know, to that point that it's clearer, it's, there is more oil. Um, and it, 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 just, it just has that uh, feeling. It is a little more sticky. So this is San Andres, we use it as wrapper. And then here, this is this is this is my, my little pleasure. This is this Sebastian's is, baby. This is my baby. <laughs> so, for you that may be familiar with it, we have a line called, called Viso Halap. Viso for the prime for the for the priming the section of, of the plant. Uh, it's a high priming viso and then Halapa because it's grown in Halapa. The entire name of the line, which is probably your one best to second best selling line. One and two. Is based around this specific wrapper. It's a process that is interesting because it's visos that have to be wrapper that are, uh, that is pre-processed partially then bought. We didn't start that process. Someone else did start it from the placenta family. And we kind of took it over uh, from there. Uh, we add very little humidity to the process and we let it work very slowly. We rotate. So to give you an idea, most uh, pinones are going to be rotated when they hit 120 to 130 plus degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the higher usually goes for everything that is filler because you don't need that same perfection in the looks of the leaf. Um, and you, you can be a little more brutal to it. But then obviously the slower and the lower uh, the better. It just means more time. So what we do here is the halapa we have, we add two years of fermentation on top of it, very little water added, and we rotate that pilon when it hits about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very slow, it's not aggressive, and what the end result is, is you get a very oily, very sweet kind of tobacco, which is, to me, is, is really exceptional. Um, I'm trying to not burn the whole, the whole factory down with my Yeah, don't, don't do that. I, I, I wish you guys would be here through the actual thing. You can feel the heat going through, but to give you an idea, the last temperature I was taken is once a day, uh, written down, was here, 100 and 104. So everything that was holiday, so we made sure there was absolutely no humidity and it was really, oh, well, not a have it actually worked. So like at 82, 82, 84, 80 range. And then once again, and then we started here in Mojado, Observación, 
they humidified it a little bit and now it's going up uh, and it's about ready to actually get that rotation again yeah just because it went up faster and that's again that's one of these things you can't know how fast it's every time it's a little different because it depends on the tobacco what stage it is in of the process how much it still has to gain or lose uh, I mean how much it has to do and um, of the general conditions of the weather but so here you have around 2,000 and something ish pounds of wrapper of Jalapa so most of it is going to come out of wrapper at the end of the process. It's being bought for wrapper. Uh, some is going to come out as filler. We always have that and a little bit of binder too. Uh, but well, it smells like a little bit of. Oh, uh, smells are free around here. Oh, it smells like dried fruit a little bit, like dried prune yeah. and stuff like this. A little bit of wood and. It's a little vegetal. It's very sweet. It's very, very, very special. So this is typically, you can see how much it still lacks, right? You can see how clear here, close to central vein it is, but you can see how beautiful that, that tobacco is gonna look like. If you think about it, it still lacks about a year of process for us before it gets, that, that pilon has been with us for about a year. So it, it lacks a full year and you can already see that the leaf could be used, but we need a specific color range. So we'll push it slowly as far as we can. But you can, one beauty of it, the beauty of it is you can see the oil still there, right? You're going to have a very rich, beautiful tobacco because it's not being rushed. Sebastian, I have a brief question for you in the meantime. As we can see, most of the hands have a blue band around them where there is certain other ones that have either a yellow or a red band what's the difference between those that's a good question probably depends where it comes from and so on uh in ours here for example the san andres is green uh the other one is blue uh here it's yellow well it's most uh it's actually a very good question i pay attention to it but i would imagine it's more probably depending on where it comes from who made it and what they had under your hand might be wrong in this but that's what i see as an explanation you also have some that um use to amarar la gavilla to uh to um uh, bind the gavilla to get together uh, switching to english spanish words sounds really weird sometimes use an actual tobacco leaf or vein too so it kind of depends um someone trying to quote no no uh, oh, I wish you could actually put your hand under here and just feel it's that it feels like a homey, comfy bed. It's that that slight heat. It's very, it's very nice. Now, here you have a prime example of tobacco that is going to need quite a bit more time, right? See that yellowish close to the veins that and the, the, the extreme shine and oil that it still has just tells you how much uh, how much more it'll need but look at the beauty of that thing i mean how clean no holes uh, here a little bit but that's that's pure rubber material right here right anyways enough of talking of tobacco and pilones we can go in and actually uh, i'll let you do you want to start walking i'll just close the oh okay so brian's gonna start taking me around and i'll just re put this stuff together so I'll take you out on the street level, and I can only go so far out there because we'll lose the uh, the Wi-Fi. But I'll give you an idea of the and uh, Reinhard. Let me know if you start losing me, okay? Because I'm gonna wander. So this is the street that we live on, the factory. It's in a residential neighborhood, and then this is building. Gorgeous. It's an old house that has uh, tobacco history in it. Uh, some people in the industry, uh, when they came down here to Danley, they have spent some time in the house. So there is some, you know, tobacco history in the house uh, that um, was really important for us as we grow. We'll always maintain this house because of the history that it has. So the first room you go into 
to the right is where they do all the sorting and pre-production work. And then they pass through to the um, production floor, which used to be the side yard or backyard to the, uh, to the house. So we'll just take you around here a little bit and show you. Now each, you know, pair works on a specific Vitola as well. Like we have a group over here, I'll show you that they, they do the Salamones only. And a lot of that is because of how they roll. They roll with the feel of the bunch in their hand. So here's the Salamones. And there's the, the bunch. Um, here you go, you're taller than me. So you got all the fall and otherwise it's hard for you. Mm. That gives you, I don't know. Gives you a little idea of the size of the show, uh, the rolling floor for us right there. Which as you can see is a smaller scale factory, right? And then you, went you already in, went, in, went in, in there. Okay, so we have part of the process sadly up there where the chairs uh, stairs go is where we can't go because of the wi-fi problem so up there you'll have everything that is um fumigation room aging room storage for uh, for packaging materials boxes for brands our brand and some other stuff for, for friends that we do and up here you'll have uh, all the packaging area which uh counts give or take about 15 people so hard work very physical that's where we came from i said you'll have uh here slowly during the day the, the tables are going to get filled to approximately up to nearly just under 7,000 cigars so we produce about give or take 6,000 cigars a day uh, right now under these conditions just some tobacco vacas and it's funny this room was literally full of boxes, tobacco boxes and pacas, where you can see what we're talking about, Placencia, right? There you go, Placencia group. Um, and was literally full of pacas to the, to, the, to the ceiling a couple of days ago. So we go through about four pacas a day of tripa of, of, um, of filler. And we're talking here, um, the, the, the filler here is about, this one is, where is it here? Seco. Where's the weight on that one? Oh, 100. Oh, I can't read that writing, that handwriting. Usually it varies between 120, 100, 120, up to 160, 180 pounds for one of these, right? One of these bales. Yeah, 144 in this. See, I couldn't read it myself. <laughs> then again, through the pilones, uh, right here, you'll have the office, which seems that most people are eating. T-shirts that were supposed to go to the U.S. and for some reason landed here at the factory. Don't ask me why. No. Uh, yeah, and so repetition of several things. Office, that's uh, what we use as working kind of plan. I'm going to get in trouble here. This is just a little conference room where they lean working here. And uh, I'm lucky I didn't get I didn't get killed. She doesn't like to get disturbed. <laughs> Not yet. Maybe tonight you get back to the uh, rolling floor here. And on this side we you have everything that is. Oh. So they have the tobacco. They that's all tobacco that has been uh, usually prepared. See, nobody has seen that, right? I didn't show it, didn't show it, broadleaf. Uh, anyways, this is um, tobacco that is usually uh, or humidified or dry, depending on the needs. The, the mojadero where we humidify the tobacco is out on the show floor. And this room we use as secadero, which is to dry the tobacco a little bit before usage, depending on how humid the, the temperatures and the climate 
crazy enough, in some cases, you put the tobacco in here to suck some humidity out of it before bringing it to the show floor. And because it's so humid outside, after a day when it's in the first room that Brian showed you, you actually have to bring it back in here because the tobacco has sucked in all the humidity again. It's And you need that right spot of humidity for every tobacco. It's a little different to be able to use it. Um, even within the filler uh, variations, you see a little bit the, the floor that we can't go to, sadly. Um, within the filler, uh, different seeds, different areas need several different types of humidity levels. But not only that, if you start having the difference between uh, a filler tobacco that you're going to use as base filler or a filler tobacco that you're going to use. Sorry, I'm trying to accommodate the, the camera again or the filler tobacco that you're going to use as a, as a base. So meaning as an extra uh, reinforcement, which should be uh, one of the finished tobacco you're going to use because of the combustion. Um, you need two different kind of humidities there because one has to be able to fold and hold everything. Um, so it's, it's all stuff when I was saying you, the same thing happened with those blue and yellow. Um, I imagine myself that it is just because of what they had on their hand. But I might be wrong. Um, and that's why we have the right people here, because we would do by ourselves a lot of mistakes. Typically, how humid every tobacco, how dry every tobacco has to be to be worked with, um, are things that are uh, in the learning curve. But then we rely on people that know exactly what they're doing. Back to the fact that you need the right team and the right people that you know, know the daily details that you might not handle as well without them. Yeah, one of the things we didn't talk about Sebastian, we just lost you. Um, I hope you can still hear me, but um, we just lost you for a brief moment. We'll try to get you back on as soon as possible. In the meantime, I mean, what a beautiful tour and what a what a great privilege and pleasure to to have the opportunity of wandering around the factory and uh, getting a, a little bit of a behind the scenes of the factory in Dan Lee in Honduras. Um, whilst we're waiting for the gents to, to come back on the show, um, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, little tour, walk around and then a sneak preview of the factory and uh, if you have questions in the meantime then um, please um, make yourselves heard sebastian you're back can you hear me yes. yeah we can hear you sorry about that no idea Not what happened all. you're back of the wi-fi here brian you were just about to say that uh, one thing we didn't talk about and then you you were cut off no well, one of the things is is the you know, the, the style of leadership that we've applied to the factory. Um, we want to create an environment that is, is, you know, everybody who is in charge of their department is a leader of their department. They're not the manager. It's not a do as I say or you're out the door kind of environment. Everybody's happy. Everybody has, you know, input into what they're doing. And, um, you know, there's just a general feel and a vibe that's very special. And it's one of the things that concerns us as we need to uh, grow. Um, how do we maintain that? How do we not lose that feeling? Uh, it's really important to us to maintain the, the culture that we've created here. Yeah, absolutely. We had a question from Macy our trusted lawyer here, who I believe very much appreciated your previous conversation about the, the whole vintage stuff, because Macy's just uh, writing an article about that for, for the Light em Up blog. But um, you had another question, Macy, I believe. Chime in. I did, and, and as a self-professed Placencia fanboy, I've got to call out the Placencia Cosecha uh, 149, the 149 which is damn near impossible to get. So nobody buy it. Tell me when it's available. I, I ha, and that's a Honduran pur, a Puro and it's exceptional. Yeah. They might use some of that. So, but anyway, um, I've got a couple of questions in uh, the ultra 
arousing tour we just had kind of gave me a lot more. So I'm just going to try to fly through them really fast. Um, actually, let me say just um, you all produced y'all, as we say down here in Mississippi, a cigar for uh, Abe Dabinod, the Smoking Connoisseur Club. And I want to say uh, that was the best cigar I've had ever from uh, that uh, line or that that program. So um, that's a really good cigar. I don't know if you remember that one at all, but um, it was exceptional. Uh, I thought I gave it a buy a box uh, rating, which is rare. Um, except they don't exist, so you can't. But um, first of all, my wife uh, is from Latin America, from Bogota, Colombia. And I, I, I've, so my question is, why did you pick Don Lee? Why uh, Honduras? And have you noticed any difference, without pissing people off, have you noticed differences between Esteli, Honduras, Costa Rica, other places? Uh, why did you pick that area? Are there kind of cultural differences, governmental safety differences? I also want to know how you all stay safe down there. I love that part of the world, but it's just a constant issue, especially if you have things, you know, worth stealing, uh, which you do based upon that tour. Um, and do people ever steal tobacco? I mean, are there still, I bet they're, um, uh, and uh, also, and, and I've been struggling with humidity lately and, and your uh, beautiful Willy Wonka tour um, got me thinking even more about this. Like they say 69%, I think that's way too high. I, and I understand, you know, rappers got to be, you know, close to 90, 100% when you're putting it on so it's moist enough. But do you have any tips as experts for us normal folks at home for proper humidification? I mean, should we just, should we dry box our cigars if they're smoking wet? Uh, where do you keep your cigars? Do you have any? So there are a bunch of questions and you can just, I guess, take and pick whichever or none that interest you. Yeah, or I like it. I like it. I like it. First of all, <laughs> that was thank a lot you. of questions. Thank yeah, you on yeah. that connoisseur comment. Um, I, I'll talk to the humidity for a second because I just moved from Reno, Nevada, in the desert to Miami, Florida. Right? Talk about changing humidity levels. <laughs> uh, you know, I went from the desert, which was dry, dry, dry. Um, you know, I was changing a humidification pack you know, every week where I now live in Miami, where I leave cigars out in my room. And uh, it's, um, it's just, a, you know, the thing about humidity for me, what I find, and this is just, you know, my humble opinion is, is that it's a personal preference, right? Um, some people like to smoke cigars very, very wet. Some people like them dry. I happen to like them on the dry side. So, you know, um, Sebastian left the cigar in the center console of the car the other day. <laughs> and uh, I, I gave him shit for it, but at, at the same time, I smoked it. So I think, you know, humidity levels are a personal choice. Some like them a little bit, uh, you know, more humid. Some like it a little bit drier. Just, I think it's about finding what, what you like, you know? I think for humidity, uh, yes, I really think so too, that it's really based on what you like. I think there is a range, right? Um, I know, for example, I, I always get into, I have a problem. I like biting, I, I really chew on my, my cigars. I walk around chewing on it and everything, get smoke in my eyes, cry, and then start over again. Um, so I like this certain kind of chewiness to that, to, to, to that, that, cigar holding with my teeth which means i like my cigars with a little bit of humidity a little extra humidity right but at the same time i work and we here work with a lot of visos and um the, these tobaccos are fairly rich i look for oiliness for richness and if you if it, the cigar is too humid you lose complexity so if the tobacco is in our case, that's very, very, very typical to, to, to Cavalier. So it's, it's, it's a little bit that playing in that range and every single blend reacts differently to different humidity levels, right? So I think in general, it's, it's a set of preference kind of thing. Um, I would still not smoke a cigar at 10% humidity, but. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, but I do, I've seen people try. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually surprised you were not one of them. No. Um, but that's that's one thing. Uh, that's on the smoking and, and, and aging kind of side of things. Um, I don't have any problems when I come back from here with a very high humidity level, go back to Dallas and leave the cigars out of a humidor for a little bit, just to kind of help it ease a little bit out of that extra humidity that you get. Uh, and, the, you know, the fact that you roll them, when you roll, you do uh, a little extra humidity to get um, uh, kind of powder because it's, I mean, just is what it is. Um, let's see. It seems the connection is a little slow. I hope you guys can hear us. Um, the, the other thing is uh, why, why it leave? Well, for me, it was a little bit when, when I started with the brand, that's where I started. Uh, I moved here and um, I moved to Central America from, from Switzerland and ended up in Dan Lee because it was hurricane season and the tour guide said, hey, I don't think Cuba and the Dominican Republic right now are a good idea. So we just, I just took his advice and went to Honduras and ended, ended up, you know, running into the Placencias and then run into Aileen that you saw earlier in the office who became my wife now a couple of years ago. And it just became home. It's it's really what it is. Now, yes, there are cultural differences. Uh, I would say all these countries have a relative stability, still third world countries and run the way they run. Uh, I would say Honduras is probably one of the most expensive ones in terms of um, labor, you know, the employment and everything, the, the salaries are actually higher here than Nicaragua, for example. Um, and I will also say that there are countries like Nicaragua are much more um, interested in making the system and the acquirement of licenses and opening of companies quicker and easier than Honduras. Honduras is pretty difficult with this and pretty complicated. But nonetheless, uh, that is what is home for us. Uh, the labor, the people that work, the employees, people are dedicated, people are very skilled. And people are willing to do take you know do the extra mile for 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 the companies they work with. So this is home, and wish, and I hope it will forever stay home because it really it feels right, right? You always have to go with that gut feeling, and it feels right. It, it and and then <clears throat> your your second part or first part, I can't remember which one was. How do you stay safe? It's like traveling to any city. Um, you know there there's you know, bad parts of every city you, you visit across the world. And, um, you know, as long as you stay and do what you're supposed to be doing while, while you're down here, I mean, if you go out looking for trouble in Miami, you'll find it. You know, if you go out looking for trouble in New York, you'll find it, Detroit, uh, LA, um, not to pick on the states, but um, you know Honduras. The people are are amazing. They're very warm. They're very, um, uh, you know, just great people. And they they still have hope here in Honduras because the government hasn't crushed that uh, part of their character like they have in some other parts of the world. They still are very 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 happy people. Would you not agree? No. So. We, as a side note, just to to uh, to add a little fun story for safety uh, kind of thing. Vlad can attest if he's still here, uh, and Jeremy, I think he's not here. But <laughs> so uh, part of uh, the experience that they had for the Honduran experience is eating hot dogs in the street in the middle of the night, um, which was very funny. Uh, Vlad still got my all my organs. <laughs> um, it's you know we 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 live here as if we were from here. So it's, it's just, we eat in the street, we walk around, we just don't look for trouble. And when, and so far we've not found it. So. No, yeah, I'll tell you a funny story about Jeremy. So Jeremy sent me a text prior to coming and he says, you know, um, if you're not gonna be picking me up at the airport, uh, please send me a picture of whoever's gonna be picking me up. 
uh, I don't want to get kidnapped. And I said, don't worry. Uh, I told all the local kidnappers that you've traveled the world enough. You don't have any vital organs to harvest anyway. So you'll be fine. So, um, you know, I, I think part of the, the you know, look, if, if Honduras was my company, if I owned Honduras, um, I would rebrand it and have a marketing campaign that highlighted the, the good side and the great beautiful sides of Honduras. It has a little bit of a branding problem, right? Like even my own mother, every time I come here, she says, you know, be careful, it's very dangerous there. And I tell her, when's the last time you were in Honduras? And she always tells me the same answer. She's never been here. So how do you know that? Because of what the media has told you. So like, if this was my company, if this country was my company, I'd put it through a rebranding and I'd highlight the beautiful side of the country because it does have a lot of the things that I look for. Like I need to have mountains and I need to have the water. And uh, th 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 this country has both of them here. And, um, you know, the city of Dan Lee is amazing. You know, I, I always like to ask people when they come visit us, uh, what when they're here for a little bit is, what did you expect when you were coming? And did we did the experience that you had here exceed what you would thought you were going to experience? And every time they tell us it does. Quick fire question on that, maybe as a, as a brief follow up with everything that's going on in the industry with the, the current shortages in terms of supply and demand. Um, and when we look at Esteli and how it evolved over the last decades, do you think that Dan Lee is prone to sort of become the next Esteli and will you will we see Dan Lee evolve to the extent that Esteli has grown and flourished as as a tobacco and cigar capital? Can I? Yeah. So first of all, um, I think it's a great question. Um, Dan Lee had more factories than it had before, but because of uh, it had more factory than it, than it has now, but because of how complicated um, the running a company here is compared to Nicaragua, and at some point the stability in Nicaragua and the cost and everything in Nicaragua were much more attractive than a lot of people went there. The reality is quite some noise is going around that some of the biggest names in the industry that have sometimes never been here have already started investing here meaning we know we're going to see some big moves uh, happen to Dan Lee in the next couple of years. There are about 25 factories in Dan Lee right now, including some monsters, right? Uh, Camacho, for example, Placencia, for example, uh, General Cigar is here. I mean, there is, there is some monster factories here, and there is also a handful of smaller, medium-sized to very small-sized factories. Um, but the reality is we do expect a big, big change, a big facelift, uh we are happy about it and at the same time worried about it <laughs> but there is there is only that many people that can work that have the skills and we don't want to see happen what has happened in some other parts at some point i mean too much demand and definitely not enough work and definitely not, not enough employees and people that want or are have the ability to work in this industry because that uh can um i mean it definitely turns the spotlight to this little piece of Central America. It does, and it's very good for the people here. It's very good for the image of the country. It's, I'm very happy for the city, um, but at the same time, uh, it, if it's too extreme, then it can become a negative thing too. Very thoughtful answer, much appreciated. Um, Brian, Sebastian, b before we wrap things up today, now that we sort of uh, took a little peek into the crystal ball for, for Dan Lee in general, let's look at the future for Cavalier. Um, you, you have already outgrown your, your current factory, even though it's, it's pretty new. Um, what's installed over the next couple of years and where do you see this whole operation grow into? Where would you like to, to see it go? And um, what's going to happen with, uh, with Cavalier now that Brian is on board and, and with the factory? Where do you see the future and the, the journey over the next couple of years? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Where do you, where do you um, see the future? Um, first of all, sorry, Anna, I just wanted to check because we had another little 
Wi-Fi shortage. Uh, do you guys still hear us okay? Yes, we hear you. We hear you perfectly. All good. So okay. I was just curious about um, where, where's uh, where's Cavalier headed with the factory, with Brian on board now. Um, what, what's the future? Very simple. I'm about to retire and Brian's about to run everything. <laughs> I'm a happy man. <laughs> you didn't. Oh, shit. <laughs> to run Wait. I'm the one that's 55 here. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, I think, you know, I, I'm going to start it and then I'll let Sebastian finish. Um, I think what you can expect um, Cavalier to do in the future is continue to grow uh, our operations here as well at the factory um, and still maintain the integrity and the ethos of the brand as as to stay as true to the brand as we can. Um, that's really important to us, as Sebastian said really early on, you have to find people that share a common vision. And we have an amazing vision. We, um, we wanna get to as many people as we can, like hearing a guy in England saying he hasn't had a chance to experience the cigars, you know, breaks our heart because you know, we might as well be talking about nothing because you haven't uh, enjoyed the experience that is Cavalier. So we'll continue to, to stay true to what we're doing. And at the same time, we'll grow and we'll build as much infrastructure down here and uh, give a home to a lot of people to uh, have a great place to work and uh, spend their days uh, enjoying what they do. So go ahead. Amen. Yeah. I think in general, if I can quickly pile on that, I'm sorry. I uh, hope we don't speak too much. We have that problem sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, so perfect. Emotional, that's what it is. Uh, I think, yes, there is, there is some things that we work on, like fixing the access to the product to some markets. Um, England is part of it. And we know that we have a lot of people that had interest in the brand as consumers. And we have not yet found the right way to bring it to uh, England. Uh, so, so those are the kind of uh, focuses we have on the sales and, and, and market side. But I think uh, most importantly, uh, what Brian mentioned is uh, we really, really, really want to continue investing here, investing in people here down in Dunley, creating more infrastructure, creating more jobs, really what it is, and, and seeing the family continue to grow. I hope we can go from, as we went from, from uh, under, like five people to uh, nearly 100 I hope we'll be able to go from 100 to 500, you know, it's, it's, but always not just as, uh, you know, just because of the growth, but mainly um, because of if, you know, it was always, let, let's put it that way. When we worked with third party factories, it was amazing. And we knew you, we were bringing some value here, but we didn't know how and where and to whom. Uh, the beauty of it now is we know how, where, and to whom we bring the value. And we hope that we bring it to about 80 people now. I hope that tomorrow we'll bring that same thing to about a you know, couple hundred more, whatever the, the size is going to be, as long as it stays well made, well done, and that we can respect the people that work with us and offer us the opportunity to do what we do. And, and thankfully, and hopefully, continue being able to do it thanks to all the support that we get from the market because ultimately there is the engine amen to that brian sebastian what a tremendous pleasure to have shared this wonderful light em up lounge together with you thanks for for taking us around and uh, allowing us a little bit of a sneak peek into your home and into the wonderful operations of cavalier genève down in dan lee honduras uh, it was a privilege, a pleasure, and an honor for me to have you on the show yet again. We wish you nothing but the very best, continued success, and um, as you always say, smoke gold, stay gold, and all the very best to you, gentlemen. Thanks. For